Today's video is brought to you by HelloFresh, the affordable, high-quality meal delivery service. More about them a little bit later. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host Simon Wamsey, one of my writers, in this case Matthew. Thank you so much, Matthew. You writes me a script. Lion Rand or The Appalachian Wanderer. The format of this show, if you're new here, I've never read it before, is going to be crime. It's going to be true. See what the genre is? True crime. We're going to explore it together. It's going to be a fun time. I mean, it's probably not because there's going to be murders. So, yeah, do all that with you, Will. Let's jump in. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. It's the middle of May. 2008, just outside of Perrysburg, Virginia, where a wild land known as Dismal Creek sits along the edge of the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest and draws visitors from all across southwestern Virginia. <laughs> There's a place actually called Dismal. Can you imagine being the real estate agent who's trying to sell houses in Dismal Creek? That's got to be miserable because people will be like, oh, it sounds a bit shit. It does sound lovely, actually. It's like between these two national parks and all that stuff that sounds really nice but it's called dismal creek does anyone really want to live in somewhere called dismal does dismal mean the same in american it means it's like it's just crap in english despite its name dismal creek and the lush forest that surround it are stunningly beautiful wild turkeys and ruffed grouse what the fuck is a ruffed grouse <laughs> roam the area and steep layered rocks guide the runoff from the nearby flat top mountain into thin shimmering waterfalls i take it all back dismal creek actually sounds amazing these waterfalls drain into pools and streams that are filled to the brim with large lively rainbow trout that are just waiting to be caught by adept fishermen and that's exactly what scott johnson is there to do standing on the bank in his fishing attire scott checks his line readies his stance and watches as his lure flies through the air and lands in the water with a soft splash he clears his mind and he lets the world around him fade away as he watches for signs of movement before long he feels a tug at the line and soon has claimed another prize fishing had been good that day and when scott goes to place his latest catch into the cooler he counts six plump trout ready for the fire oh my god scott is going to have a feast jesus satisfied he loads his fishing gear into the bed of his truck to set off toward the mountaintop as he drives along the narrow winding road scott notices a dog standing beside the creek and slows his truck to take a closer look the dog has a collar around its neck but that is not the first thing that draws scott's eye instead he immediately notices the dog's anemic white gums and sickly swollen belly as a woodman he knows these are obvious signs of malnourishment i feel like if i saw a dog like that i'd be like yeah, i need some food because the swollen belly is like the fame the classic case of being hungry right i'd also be like backing away from that dog <laughs> be like i don't know i'm pretty sure that's hunger but it could also be rabies and i don't want rabies scott shifts his truck into park and steps out to take a closer look as he does a man appears from the creek bed below he's so gaunt that his sharp cheekbones look like they might rip through the paper thin skin on his face his pants and reflective hunting jacket sag around his withered body his mouth hangs lazily open as he stares back silently scott asks if the man wants assistance but his question is never answered instead the man complains the fish just aren't biting today oh my god this dude's lost his mind right like he's been out in the forest with his dog and he must have got lost or something right that's my initial vibe it's like this guy's been lost in the mountains for like weeks and he's starving and so is his dog and how is his dog not eating him or how is he not eating the dog <laughs> i'll be like i'm getting a little bit hungry <laughs> sorry fido <laughs> Scott takes a sympathetic look at him and remembers the cooler filled with fish and wonders for a moment of his good fortune that day had been a sign. Perhaps someone above had known exactly who he was about to meet and had intended for him to share it with the starving man. It's all very biblical, isn't it? Where the fish bites, he's got like his, all of his fish and shit and he's going to share it with the starving man like a good Samaritan. But it's all just coincidence. He then lets down the tailgate of his truck, lifts the lid of the cooler and presents its contents to the man. He then loads two fish into a bag and hands it to him. Here, you can have these, Scott says. The man graciously accepts and unloads the fish into his own empty cooler. He then introduces himself as Ricky Williams. Scott asks if he is related to THE Ricky Williams, the American football player, but Ricky denies it and just laughs awkwardly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's an unnecessary little detail there, I feel, but does that... I don't know. I guess I just don't know who Ricky Williams is. So that's okay. Not his name. It is his name. He could be mega famous. He could be like that... Um, oh, what's that name? The, the guy I know. I know one football player. 
Um, God damn it. He's married to that woman. Well, obviously. I mean, not necessarily obviously, but you know what I mean. Ah, God damn it. Tom Brady. Who's Tom Brady married to? Now that's going to bug me. Isn't he? I always get him confused, and I have no idea why. I get him confused with the guy who's the lead singer of Maroon 5. <laughs> I don't know why. Are they both married to like Victoria's Secret models or something? Is that is that where I'm getting confused? It doesn't. Or maybe the guy from Marine Five Not anymore, right? Ah, that's that's mean. For a few minutes, two share fishing techniques and talk about their favorite sports teams, but the conversation never seems to go any deeper than that. Overall, Scott finds Ricky to be a bit odd, but attributes his strange speed pattern and jerky behavior to simple hunger and chooses to ignore it. This guy's obviously starving. He's like super malnutrition. Do you like you like sports? I love sports. <laughs> Why aren't we talking about the fact that he's got something clearly wrong with him and also his dog is starving? What are you doing? After the slightly awkward conversation, he wishes Ricky the best of luck, gives his dog a pat on the head, climbs back into his truck, starts the engine, and continues his journey up the mountain. Several hours later, after spending the remainder of the afternoon enjoying nature, Scott arrives at his destination, where Sean Farmer, his camping partner and lifelong friend, is putting the finishing touches on their campsite. As he steps out of his truck, Scott notices the same man, Ricky Williams, sitting beside this campfire and speaking jovially with his friend. Wait, did he just drive the whole afternoon and he just happens to end up at the same place? He drove the whole afternoon. What are the odds of this? He learns from Sean that after seeing Ricky by the creek several hours earlier, the man had approached Sean and informed him that he and Scott were friends and that they'd been fishing together. Sean, who, like Scott, had also been concerned by the man's appearance, invited him to stay for dinner, and Ricky had graciously accepted. <laughs> this Ricky guy sounds like he's going to get up to some murdering. <sighs> I don't know why, it's just my vibe, you know, this being a true crime show, show and all. As the night progresses, Ricky becomes more comfortable around Scott and Sean. He begins telling incredible stories about his time at Virginia Tech, where he graduated valedictorian, and how more recently he had authored several papers for NASA's research and development team. He then brags them about his many romantic partners and watches closely for their reactions. I'll be like, please, <laughs> the starving guy who can't even catch a fish. He's like, yeah, no, I'm gonna just like, okay, chill out, dude. Why You don't have to lie, just tell us an interesting story that's real. The more the man talks, the more grandiose and unbelievable his stories become. Every new detail seems less like a recounting of his own life and more like a fantasy that he's crafting on the spot, desperately hoping to impress his new friends. Scott, there's no, you don't need to, I don't know. I find like, people who try and impress, it's like, I don't want to be their friends, I just want to be friends with someone who's got like an interesting thing or an interesting take. I don't need to know all about your background, just... You know, that's, it just, I don't know, it just feels a bit unnecessary, doesn't it? It's also unpleasant. Like, I never bring up anything that I do that's interesting when I'm meeting people for the first time. Because you don't want to come across like, I don't know, like a bit of a douche. It's like, no, I'm, <laughs> I do this, I do that, NASA. Ah. Scott and Sean periodically exchange skeptical glances at one another, but they never question him. After the fish are cooked, the three men eat hungrily. Ricky scarfs down his food so quickly that he's already going in for seconds, around the time that Scott is taking his first bite. Scott looks down to the whimpering dog beside him and holds out a piece of fish, piece of fish in his hands. The dog swallows it eagerly, and then two more. Over the next three hours, Ricky continues his tall tales, and the sun begins to set. Scott and Sean look to another. They wonder why the strange man hasn't left yet. Surely they think he must be worried about traveling alone after dark. Bears, cougars, snakes, and other dangerous wildlife roam the area and once the sun goes down he'd basically be walking blind i'm a little bit confused because this guy's walking but didn't we say that the dude who was fishing the other dude that the scott or sean I, I lose track because their names are so similar uh, i think it was scott right um didn't we say he drove like all afternoon or was like because he was in a car right as if on cue ricky stands up and calls to his dog come on boy time to go we need to let these men rest it's been a long day ricky thanks the man for their hospitality and just as sean is about to offer him some more food for the road a loud bang halts the words in his throat. Scott looks up and sees Ricky's arm outstretched towards his friends. Blood erupts from a hole in Sean's face, and he watches as Ricky turns to face him. Now he sees it, a small gun barely larger than the man's palm pointed directly at him. Oh my god, did this take a turn. I was like, it's lightning. Please let it be lightning. And then I'm like, oh no, it's a true crime show. I know it's a gun. Why'd you have to murder his friend, you bastard? The Appalachian Trail. 
As I said at the beginning of the episode, Dismal Creek is a beautiful little spot, and while I haven't personally had the chance to see it, most who do end up traveling through the area because of the nearby Appalachian Trail. As the longest footpath existing in the world today, the trail stretches over 2,000 miles from its start in Georgia through 14 states until finally terminating at the peak of Mount Curtidon in Maine. The trail attracts everyone from cyclists and fishermen to paddlers and sightseers, although the thing that draws more visitors than all of them combined is hiking. About a decade ago, I hiked a small portion of the trail in northern Georgia, and it was one of the most beautiful and peaceful experiences of my life. <laughs> this is um this is Matthew typing this, but I've also um hiked the hiked a part of the Appalachian Trail in northern Georgia. It was longer than ten years ago. It was what? Fifteen years ago? Something like that. It was really beautiful. It's a beautiful part of the country. I have family in Georgia, so uh, I went out to stay with them in Atlanta and then they were like, You should go hiking on this Appalachian Trail. I was like, okay. It's really nice. It's really beautiful. So much nature. America's so big. <laughs> America's numerous national forests are one thing that every American can truly take unfettered pride in. With countless access points peppering the entire trail, you can easily gain access to a segment that is either as easy or as difficult as your skill requires. So, if you ever get the chance to visit, I highly encourage you to do so. Now, I'm aware that recommendation may seem ill-timed. After all, there are a few things just terrifying as being trapped alone in the woods with a gun-wielding psychopath. However, allow me to ease your mind with some statistics. Yeah, it's always like, you read about this, it's like, I'm never going there. It's like the odds of you getting shot by a random starving fisherman is fairly low. That's not happening this time. Despite receiving over 3 million visitors per year, there is only an average of about one homicide every four years. That puts your odds of dying on the trail at the hands of a murderer at about 0.000. .000 percent. <laughs> that means that statistically you're far more likely to be killed while doing something innocuous in your own home like preparing dinner or relaxing on the couch or listening to the latest episode of The Casual Criminalist. <laughs> Especially because you're listening to this while driving, you're like, oh my god, it's so compelling, I'm not even paying attention to the road. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Of course you are. It's not that compelling. So, with that information in mind, would it surprise you to learn that just 27 years earlier, a double homicide was committed within a single mile of the exact location where Scott Johnson and Sean Farmer made camp? I mean, yes, it would, but also it wouldn't, because I get the feeling it's probably committed by the same dude, right? If there's a double homicide in the middle of nowhere, and then there's another double homicide in the middle of nowhere, you're going to be like, are those two things connected? Nah! Yes! Yes, they're connected. Of course they are. Now, let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh can help you eat better during the holiday season by offering you easy to prepare yet healthy meals. I don't know. Every Christmas. It's like whenever I go home and see my parents, I always eat too much. Christmas, I always eat too, eat too much. And those tend to be pretty much the only times a year where I, you know, you get back for a little trip or you get back for Christmas and you're like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Less eating for a while, okay, fact boy. Um, but HelloFresh make it just better and easier because you're like, you can choose the healthy options. It's delivered straight to your door, saving you countless hours of hectic holiday season shopping in huge crowds. Nothing worse than going to the supermarket anyway, especially when everyone's like rushing around like crazy for Christmas stuff. I don't get it. I hate it. You can rely on HelloFresh to provide plenty of simple and quick recipes with more than 35 recipes available to choose from each week across their family-friendly, fit and wholesome, and veggie offerings. So really something for everyone there. Look, if you're traveling over the holidays, HelloFresh will also work around your schedule, change your delivery days, your preference, and your address in just a few clicks. I didn't even think about that. You could be going somewhere else, just for a holiday or whatever, and you could take your HelloFresh with you. That's amazing. I didn't even think of that. That's very nice, HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code CRIMINALIST18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Again, CRIMINALIST18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping at HelloFresh.com. Thank you so much, HelloFresh. And now back to today's video. The Disappearance for most people who visit the Appalachian Trail, a simple weekend trip is all they could ever want. However, there are some who seek to push their bodies and their minds the absolute limit by through hiking the trail's entire 2,000 mile length in a single year. The, yeah, it takes, I think it takes like six months to do the whole trail. Didn't Bill Bryson do it? Isn't the Walk in the Woods a Walk in the Woods? Did he do that? It's been a long time since I read The Walk in the Woods. A Walk in the Woods? The Walk in the Woods? I don't remember. 
These extremely motivated and rugged individuals, of whom I am extremely envious, spend years preparing to face everything from physical challenges of walking 15 to 20 miles per day through difficult terrain and erratic weather to the mental challenges that come from their mind's desire to give up. In the spring of 1981, Susan Ramsey and Robert Mountford set out from the trail start in Fanning County, Georgia, with the goal of completing the trail in just seven short months. There we go, seven months. The pair were social workers from Maine who were using the journey as a means to raise money for disabled children. By early May, they crossed into Virginia, and with Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee behind them, they were right on schedule and making excellent progress. Once their journey was completed, they hoped to add their names to the coveted list of end-to-enders, as they are known, a feat that by 1980, 45 years after the trail's completion, fewer than 600 individuals had managed to accomplish. As is common among the hiking community, Susan and Robert had even managed to make several new friends along the way. One of them was a female hiker who was also through hiking the trail. After meeting the three of them, they traveled together for several days. During this time, Susan and Robert told the women all about the motivation for their journey. They told her about the many preparations they had made and stressed to her that nothing short of the apocalypse itself could stop them from completing their journey. Later on, the women decided to push ahead at a quicker pace, but the three of them agreed to regroup just outside of Perrysburg, Virginia, in the following days to resupply and rest before continuing on. The women arrived on schedule, but Susan and Robert never would. At first, the women assumed that they had been delayed and would arrive the following day. However, as the next day came and went, she became increasingly concerned for the pair's safety. She had not forgotten how Robert had stressed the importance of their journey and knew that something must have gone terribly wrong. She phoned the state police for help. The desk on which Susan and Robert's file eventually would land was that of Deputy Sheriff Tom Lawson of the Giles County Sheriff's Office. He had been handed the case by the Virginia State Police, along with a description of the hikers and their last known location. Lawson began his investigation into the missing hikers the same way that he began every investigation into missing tourists, by calling their parents. Now, This may seem like a strange thing to do, considering the pair were grown adults. However, Lawson knew that the vast majority of missing persons cases, particularly those that involved hikers attempting their first through-hike, many who were presumed missing were actually safe at home after becoming overwhelmed by the journey's many unexpected challenges. He also knew that when people fail at something, the first person they usually contact is their parents or a loved one for support yeah i think that's totally reasonable it's like my kids are too young to be called um and if i was somewhere with my wife i think like well who's my next of kin after my wife it's got to be my parents right so it's totally reasonable that the police would call my parents even if there wasn't all the hiking stuff around it that would be like a fairly sensible call to make to accomplish this, Lawson searched the trail's voluntarily registration forms to find necessary contact information. After retrieving it, he made several calls, but unfortunately, neither family had heard from them. During the call with Robert's father, Robert Mountford Sr., Deputy Lawson was urged to take the case very seriously. Bobby is too good of a woodsman to get lost, Robert's father added. Lawson assured the man that he would do everything in his power to locate his son, and he requested a recent photo of Robert to aid in the search. While it was certainly not uncommon for hikers to go missing along the Appalachian Trail, the section of the trail that stretched along Bearersburg was extremely well marked, and as a result, most people did not have trouble following it. Because of the elder Mountford's comments about his son's hiking abilities, the case immediately stuck out in Lawson's mind as something to be concerned about. The following morning, he arrived at the trail and began speaking with campers to see if anyone else may have encountered the couple. One man said that he briefly spoke with them outside of a hiking shelter called Wapiti and noted that he was in good health. He asked the man which direction they were headed, but he was unsure. To get an idea of their whereabouts and recent movements, Lawson traveled north in search of one of the trail's registers. The register, sometimes referred to as logbooks or guestbooks, are large books located at the Appalachian Trail at Shelter's campsite and some trail ends. They're used by hikers to document their journey and leave encouraging messages to those that come behind them. Police often turn to them to establish a timeline and narrow down their search when someone goes missing. However, when Lawson arrived at the location, one of the registers was missing. Still determined to find them, Lawson visited a nearby shop called Trent's. When through hiking the trail, it's necessary to limit the number of supplies that you carry with you in order to avoid over encumbering yourself. Yeah, what are you going to do? Carry like seven months worth of supplies on you? No. That's stupid. <laughs> because of this, frequent resupplies are necessary, and locations like Trent do well because of their close proximity to the trail. When Lawson arrived, he approached the cashier and asked him for information. To his surprise, the cashier had actually seen them. He told Lawson that Susan and Robert had visited for a resupply several days earlier, but he did not know where they were intending to go next. Lawson then took statements from several other store employees who also claimed to have seen them that day. Just as was the case with the owner, none of them knew 
where the two were planning to go next. This was becoming a common theme. The pair were seen somewhere by someone, and then suddenly they vanished. I mean, it's not exactly surprising, though, is it? It's like, well, they're on a hiking trail. Of course they're going to go somewhere, they're going to get some supplies, and then they're going to vanish. It's called hiking. Otherwise, it would be called staying in one place, wouldn't it? It was at this time that someone spoke up and said that an odd-looking man had visited the store earlier in the week, claiming to know what had happened to the lost hikers. Lawson's interest was piqued. He asked for the man's name. Lion Randall, the person replied. <laughs> he knows where it is. The guy's nickname is Lying Randall. <laughs> the deputy scoffed. <laughs> Sounds like a real nutcase. Now, you might be tempted to blame Deputy Lawson for not immediately following up on this lead. However, I will point out, at this point in the investigation, there was still no evidence that a crime had been committed. After all, in a time before cell phones, it was extremely common for people hiking the trail to disappear for a few days before eventually turning up several days later further on down the trail. Or, for all he knew, the two could have simply grown tired of their journey and decided to hole up in a hotel room for a couple of days without telling anyone. It certainly wouldn't have been the first time that that was the case. Add to it the fact that the name Deputy Lawson had been given was literally preceded by the word lying and i can't really blame him for not dropping everything to chase down this unlikely lead but now word was really beginning to spread about the missing hikers several people offered up what they knew although most didn't know much several more people claimed to have seen them at one point or another but nobody could provide a solid lead Finally, on May the 30th, nearly two full weeks since Susan and Robert had been seen, the deputy was reminded of a tip that he received earlier in the case. One of the people he had spoken to had mentioned seeing the pair near Wapiti shelter, and to follow up on it, Lawson and a group of investigators traveled up the trail to that shelter. When they arrived, their hearts immediately sank. The first thing Deputy Lawson noticed was the floor of the shelter. Wapiti, like many other rest points set along the trail, was a rustic wooden structure that provided hikers with a dry place to sleep during nights of bad weather. This particular shelter was fairly new, and all of its lumber should have been uniform in color. However, the floorboards were an entirely different shade than the rest of the structure. While the walls and roof were a natural, unstained color, the floor was almost dark enough to be considered black, as if someone had intentionally stained it. Oh god, are they going to have been murdered? Is this blood stains? Lawson crouched and pulled out his pocket knife. He stuck the tip of the blade into a gap between two of the floorboards and stra- scraped out a mixture of mud, leaves, and what appeared to be dried blood. He then ordered the floorboards to be removed, and moments later, an officer arrived with a crowbar. As soon as the first board came up, Lawson shined his flashlight into the darkness, revealing a large pool of reddish brown dried blood. Investigators immediately knew they were standing in a crime scene. While there were no bodies to be found underneath the shelter, the sheer amount of blood confirmed that whoever had been injured there was likely no longer alive. The Discovery Now certain that a crime had been committed and fearing the worst, Lawson made a call. Within an hour, a team of investigators arrived and began processing the crime scene. With no body to be found, Lawson ordered his men to fan out and search the area immediately surrounding Wapiti Shelter. After a brief search, one of the officers stumbled across a pile of leaves that appeared to be covering something. As the group carefully brushed them aside, the top of a sleeping bag was revealed. Once they pulled open the front flap, they saw the upper body of a woman. The body told a story. It was like something straight out of a slasher film. Now, to spare you the goriest details, all I'll say is that the woman's body had been punctured 13 separate times by a sharp object. When investigators turned the body over, they found that her head was split open. After removing her from the sleeping bag, they found that her hands showed signs of defensive wounds. Buried with the body, investigators discovered what they assumed to be the murder weapon, a wrought iron fire poker, and a large spiked nail. The following day, cadaver dogs were brought in to aid in the search. They combed the woods near Susan's body, and they eventually signaled in the direction of a large stump. Investigators began digging in the area and quickly found a second sleeping bag. Inside it, they found the body of Robert Mountford with three gunshot wounds, one in his head, two in his face. Deputy Lawson and his men shut down the portion of the trail that ran through Giles County, something that was very controversial at the time, and began expanding their search. (laughs) You can't shut down our trail. It's like, yo, there's been a murder. There's been a murder. Priorities, guys. <laughs> ah, some people. Spare clothing, canteens, food items, maps, and journals, all belonging to the victims, were discovered scattered around the forest surrounding Wapiti Shelter. They were buried under logs, hidden within downed trees, placed under rocks, covered in leaves, tossed in high grass. It was as if the killer had deliberately spread their belongings all over the area at random. A camera was found, but to the disappointment of investigators, the film had been removed. Eventually, a backpack belonging to Susan was found that contained two paperback novels. Inside the cover of one of them, a bloody fingerprint. A suspect. Over the next three weeks, investigators continued 
to comb the area in search of clues. While much evidence had been found near Wapiti, the only solid lead they had was the bloody fingerprints, and their department had yet to find a match for it. By this time, the trail had been closed for a full three weeks, and Deputy Lawson was being pressured to reopen it. While I can't find the exact reason for this pressure, Lawson said in 2009 in an interview with Dateline's Chris Hansen that people up at the federal government level were putting pressure on him to make a statement declaring that there was no serial killer walking the Appalachian Trail. Politicians c**k right off, to be honest. Um, or federal government? Is that politicians? What is that? I guess that could be like big, like, FBI? Police chiefs? Something like that? Well, whatever the case is, it's like, how about you do the, let the police do their work and stop telling them not to say something that they're not sure of? And also, why would you even assume there was a serial killer? It's just a double murder so far. Lawson was resistant to open the trail because, like a legend, he didn't want to put more people at risk. Yeah. This guy sounds like a proper policeman. Stop f***ing with his business and let him do his job. Finally, after weeks of work, there was a break in the case. The bloody fingerprints that was discovered inside Susan's book came back as a match for an employee at a shipyard in Newport News, Virginia. As part of the hiring process, employees had to submit fingerprinting, and those specific prints belonged to a man named Randall Lee Smith. Let me guess, this is our lion Randall. Randall's a name that I have such... Did you guys watch when you were kids? There was a TV show called Recess, and... There was like TJ and his gang, and then there was this one kid called Randall who was always f***ing it up for them. And I've always thought since watching that TV show, I was like, oh, Randall. Randall's the, Randall's the snitch. He always makes it less fun. Investigators began looking into Smith and quickly discovered that he was no longer employed at the shipyard. A record search revealed that after leaving his position, Smith had moved back home to live with his mother right there in Petersburg. Later that day, Deputy Lawson, along with a team of officers from the Giles County Sheriff's Office, arrived at the home of Randall Smith's mother. The home itself was a modest single-story residence with white siding and an empty gravel driveway. With their weapons at the ready, they cautiously approached and gave an authoritative knock on the wobbly screen door. There was no answer. With warrant in hand, the police broke down the door and entered. In the basement, they found a pile of blood-stained clothes soaking in water, along with several items that belonged to Susan and Robert. Upstairs inside Smith's bedroom, things began to get strange. On his desk, Deputy Lawson discovered a ransom note. While I couldn't find the full text of the note online, the description of it states that it was hastily written and alluded to the fact that Randall Smith had been framed for the murders of Susan and Robert. It said that the real killers had kidnapped Randall and were going to kill him next. Um, I just, I just don't believe this because I think Randall's our bad guy. There were no demands on the note and no reason given for its creation. It existed solely as an admission of guilt from some unknown third party, which makes no sense. <laughs> After a quick visual comparison between the ransom note and the other handwritten notes that were scattered across the desk, Deputy Lawson concluded that the kidnapping note was written by Smith himself with absolutely no attempt whatsoever at disguising his own handwriting. <laughs> All right, so lion brands are late. A ain't, ain't the brightest spark in the uh i'm not the brightest spark in the what does the brightest spark go in brightest spark in the fire <laughs> brightest spark in the i got nothing sharpest knife in the drawer there we go that's better i think you say not quite a bright spark right you don't say brightest spark in the something we can move on from this it's not important it's at this point in our story that I should probably go ahead and mention that despite being known as Lion Randall, Randall Smith was not very good at lying. He was actually very, very bad at it. Comically bad, which will be a theme as we go on with this episode. Lawson continued his search of Smith's bedroom and discovered a startlingly large amount of laminated pornography and homemade sex toys. Oh my. Many of which have been fashioned out of old medical instruments stolen from the county hospital. Oh my, oh my. What are you up to? Why? <laughs> Laminating your pornography is weird, dude. <laughs> What's that laminator for? That making cards? <laughs> making IDs? No, not for that. After collecting those items with double gloved hands, Lawson exited through the back door and observed the forested area that sat beside behind Smith's home. Deputy Lawson then realized they were actually much closer to the crime scene than they'd originally thought. If not for the trees and mountainous terrain, he believed that he would be able to see Wapiti's shelter from where he stood that very moment. It could have been no more than a mile away. With no doubt left in his mind, Deputy Lawson put out an APB on Smith's truck and began interviewing the neighbors to get a clearer idea of who Randall Smith really was. However, this would prove more difficult than he imagined. Lion Randall 
Randall Lee Smith was born on June the 29th, 1953, to his mother, Loretta Smith, and father whose name has not been made public as far as I can tell. For whatever reason, Randall's father abandoned him when Randall was only six months old, and by the time he had turned one, his parents' divorce had been finalized. Randall never saw his father again, and his mother never received any child support or alimony that could have been used to help support either of them. Now on their own, Loretta took a job as a custodian at Giles Memorial Hospital, where she earned a meager paycheck. Her co-workers regarded her as a nice lady with few ambitions. She made a living, and that's about it. The Smith family of two had little, and that was on purpose. For the first few years of Randall's life, he and Loretta moved from home to home, just barely baking ends meet. The more they owned, the more they had to move, so they traveled lightly. They stayed with friends whenever possible and rented various places when Loretta had the money. When she did not, they slept in her vehicle. One curious thing to note is that up until the age of three, Loretta dressed Randall exclusively in traditional feminine colors and dresses. I'm sure that's going to be <laughs> like, I'm all for, like, you know, like, um, you know, be who you want to be and all that. But that's going to that's going to be weird for a kid, isn't it? That's going to be weird. That's it's, that's yeah, especially like back in the 50s. I know. <laughs> I I don't want to be at all surprised by this because I'm not surprised by it, but it's just like my I, I just feel like I have just general outrage at the fact that um people can't support their family with a job. I know this is the 1950s, but I know this still happens today, which is just nuts. Like she's working as a custodian, like a janitor, right? Like someone who cleans was it a school or whatever? No, a hospital, and that is not enough money for her to reliably afford accommodation. Is just like that's just nuts. That is, society is broken, if that's what's going on. While this wasn't the most outlandish thing, as up until the early 20th century, most clothing for infants and young children was unisex, she was also known to frequently refer to Randall as her daughter. This was certainly not normal, and the reason for it is not known. Neighbors noted that they felt it was a very odd thing to do, and that young Randall was never quite comfortable with it. Finally, after saving up enough money, Loretta purchased a home adjacent to her sister and brother-in-law. The two had a hand in raising Randall and often looked after him while his mother was at work. Seeing that Randall was a loner, his aunt encouraged the boy to go outside and make friends with the children that often played around their neighborhood. However, Randall simply wasn't interested. He preferred to isolate himself inside their home and stay far away from anyone outside of their immediate family. She would eventually tell the police that Randall stayed too much to himself and that for a child to not ever have a friend, that's unusual. His uncle would eventually take up a fatherly role by taking Randall on camping trips into the woods behind their homes. It was during these trips that Randall developed a love for nature. Soon, most of his spare time was spent in the forests behind his mother's home, searching for arrowheads and collecting fossilized bone fragments. The following year, when Randall finally started school, he was introduced to and forced to spend time with children his own age. Unsurprisingly, they found the young woods-obsessed loner child to be a bit peculiar, and Randall was treated like a bit of an outcast. In an attempt to win them over, Randall told fascinating stories about his life. Some of these stories were borderline believable, like the fact that his father was a war hero and was killed in action, while others were outlandish, like claiming that his family were actually secret millionaires. When his classmates asked him why they didn't live in a mansion, <laughs> yeah, the past. It's like, millionaires, does it, is it, is it what it used to be? Like back in the day, it's like, he's a millionaire! And it'd be like, oh my god, he must live in a mansion. And now it's like, no, he just lives in a regular sized house, because houses are super expensive <laughs> like my parents are buying a house and i'm like holy shit, houses are expensive i mean they obviously own a house they're like old but <laughs> oh god <laughs> now they, they listen to this i mean not that old like older than me that's what i meant <laughs> parents that's what i meant but it's like shit. like i don't live in the uk but i mean housing is expensive here as well but in the uk it's just mental like i'm like oh my god how, how do yeah anyway when his classmates asked him why he didn't live in a mansion, he told them that his mother didn't want to spoil him. This was a common response, as when Randall was called out on his lies, he'd often double down on them and become angry. Before long, his lies were folding in on themselves. Randall was no longer able to keep track of his numerous stories. His tall tales quickly gained him a reputation as a liar, and he was given the unaffectionate nickname L.R., which stood for Lion Randall. <laughs> Now, you might think that this nickname would have bothered someone who disliked being confronted about his lies. However, young Randall seemed to embrace it. It made him feel as if he was finally being accepted by those around him. It's like, mate, they're not accepting you just because you've got a nickname. If, like, your nickname was Fucky McFuckface, that it's not because you've made friends, it's because they don't like you. <laughs> when others teased him with the nickname, he would casually turn around with a smile and ask, What can I do for you? 
When Randall entered high school, his potential friend group grew. However, he still struggled to connect with anyone. In an attempt to gain respect among his classmates, he continued to tell lies to anyone who would listen. He claimed to be a ladies' man with multiple girlfriends who he said attended different schools in surrounding counties. Everyone, though just rolled their eyes at him. He bragged about attending parties, even though those who were actually in attendance knew for sure that he was not there. By this time in his life, when Randall was inevitably caught in a lie, he simply shook his head and called those who questioned him fools. He desperately wanted to be anyone but himself, but he did not seem interested or able to change who he was. He wanted all of the glory and bragging rights afforded to someone who had accomplished great things, but he did not want to put in the effort to achieve those great things. <laughs> Before graduating high school, he dropped out of classes in the 11th grade and left home to become a welder in Newport News, Virginia. Unfortunately, his unreliable nature made it impossible for him to maintain steady employment. He was quickly fired. After this, Randall returned home and began working odd jobs around town wherever they were available. One of the people that Randall frequently worked for was a man named John Spar. While between jobs, Spar allowed Randall to earn extra money by working on cars and trucks in his garage. He knew about Randall's reputation, but took pity on him, allowing him to come and go as he pleased without asking too many questions. Sometimes Randall would show up as scheduled for several weeks in a row, only to suddenly drop off the face of the earth for a month or more. When he finally returned, he would do so with grandiose and overly detailed explanations about what had happened to him. They were completely unbelievable, however, but Spauer rarely questioned them. Spauer was considered to be the closest thing that Randall ever had to an actual friend. Once after returning from a particularly long hiatus, he claimed that he had met a woman in Florida to whom he was now engaged. He bragged about her family's wealth and said that he would be moving south in the following weeks to start a job as a supervisor at a fact father's boat factory. <laughs> it's so overly detailed. It's like whenever someone's like saying or like you read it happens with like historical sources, you'll read something like from back back in the day and it'll be way too detailed and you'd be like, bro bro you make a shit up you added some details in there because no one would remember this bro seeing as her father was so unbelievably wealthy they'd also been given a house in which to live as a wedding gift eventually randall's supposed wedding day came and went without any acknowledgement from him or anyone else and he never mentioned it again <laughs> sometime later randall complained that his estranged ex-girlfriend arrived in town to drop off children of whom he claimed to have no prior knowledge after that he would use his fictional children as an excuse to get out of work or take off early when they became ill in reality he just wanted a weekend off to go hiking and was looking to drum up sympathy from those around him this guy just sounds like such a prick people like this i have to say i don't really know anyone who's like you know just some epic i mean other than like when you're like a kid like below what like six or seven and someone will tell us about outrageous lie and you'll be like wow and then you'll find out it's not true and they'll be like yeah i just made that up <laughs> you'll be like what the fuck? but you know kids but like as an adult i don't think i've ever known anyone who's just told like lies for no reason it seems so bizarre and so douchey <laughs> i mean everyone like you know They'll exaggerate a story a little bit, but just to be like, no, 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 I was going to get married to uh, this woman and her father's super rich. She bought us a house and I work in a boat factory making boats. That is just so, so bold. Sh like, what's up? <laughs> Spauer never met any of these women and believed that Randall had most likely never been in an actual relationship. Once while the two of them were driving through town, Randall pointed to a store and said, My lady works behind the counter in there. Spauer pulled up to the store and said he needed to use the restroom. He asked if Randall would like to go inside, say hello to his girlfriend, but he refused. After using the restroom, Spauer returned to the truck and Randall didn't speak to him for the remainder of the drive. <laughs> Spauer's like, Ranny, mate, I know. I know, I didn't need to be. I just wanted to go in there. There's an old dude behind the counter. There's not some young lady in there. You lying, Randall. Lying, Randall. Just, it just, he knows. That's it. He's like, just fix those cars for me and I'll keep betting you. And that's it. For the next few years of his life, Randall continued working for Spa when he felt like it. And while he certainly, and while it certainly didn't make him rich, it did afford, allow him to afford quality hiking and camping supplies that he used to continue exploring the Appalachian Trail. While hiking, Randall would sometimes disappear for days at a time without anyone, including his own mother, noticing. These trips provided him with a good source of exercise. And by the time he reached the age of 20, the once frail boy had begun to put on weight and muscle. He was described as fleshy, like a football player who had given up training yeah it's like dudes who go to the gym too much and then stop going to the gym but continue eating like they go to the gym and it's like they're just big dudes and then like just just turn into like big heavy dudes <laughs> it's happened so often it's like i feel like that's the risk of going to the gym it's like if you get big and then you stop going to the gym you just kind of become a bit flabby 
so i don't know i've never been like a big gym person i used to be fairly like properly skinny and then i went to the gym at a university for a couple of years and i put on some muscle and then i stopped going to the gym and so maybe my whole theory about people becoming like gym flabby is just not true because i just never was skinny again but also not like too bulky i guess either that or i just grew up a little bit i don't know <laughs> whatever let's carry on the hunt now that Deputy Lawson had pieced together as clear a picture of Randall Smith as was possible, he used the evidence found within Smith's home to acquire an arrest warrant. Because of Smith's limited resources, investigators assumed that he could not have traveled far. They began searching the nearby forest, first focusing on spots where he was known to make camp. After that, they widened their search to cover several miles behind the Smith's home. Unfortunately, after nearly a week of exhaustive, fruitless searching, Deputy Lawson and his team ended their manhunt with nothing to show for it. Just as Susan and Robert had done, Randall Smith had seemingly vanished, and investigators began to wonder if the fake kidnapping letter found on Randall's desk was actually his own version of a suicide note. Let me explain. By this point, police knew that Randall Smith was known for his tall tales, and they also knew that he desperately wanted people to believe them. He wasn't satisfied with his boring, unfulfilled life, so they wondered what if this whole thing was an elaborate setup to make everyone question what they thought they knew about him? What if he had decided to build an unbelievable narrative about murder and kidnapping, a story that no one in their right mind would believe that would eventually prove to be truthful when his dead body was eventually discovered? But I always find this very strange because you're dead. Like, that is, like, literally, you could not possibly care any less. You're dead. Like, why do you need to spin this whole thing about, like, before you die? Because you won't care afterwards. It doesn't matter. Your legacy is not important in any way whatsoever. To you, I mean, it might be important to other people left behind and stuff, but to you, it doesn't matter because you're dead. I always find that quite strange. I can only imagine that Randall was giddy with the idea of everyone trying desperately to recall everything he had ever said to them. I'm sure that he relished the idea of them desperately trying to separate fact from fiction as they pieced together the truth. Perhaps he liked the idea of his entire mysterious life being scrutinized, and he hoped that it would make people think that he was more than he actually was. Whatever the case, Deputy Lawson was exhausted, and the case was going nowhere. It had been nearly a month since the investigation had begun, and there were still no leads on Randall's location. Since the case seemed like he might be going cold, Lawson decided to take his family on a weekend vacation to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, in order to clear his mind. He hoped that the change of scenery would give him time to reflect on the case, and when he returned, he might be able to offer a new perspective. The next thing that happened was so unlikely that I had to triple check my sources to ensure that I was not reading a fictitious recounting of the events. I even purchased an online subscription to the Roanoke Times, which cost me a whopping 99 cents for six months. Roanoke Times? That's a bargain, Roanoke Times. So Simon, try not to pass out when you see such a hefty list sum list on, listed on my next invoice. <laughs> While on vacation in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Deputy Lawson was sitting in a motel room when he received a call stating that a person matching Randall Smith's description had been arrested and was being held in, of all places, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Wait, how far away are these places from each other? That's the thing I don't know. But still, it is a hell of a coincidence, isn't it? On June 11, 1981, Randall's truck had been discovered in an abandoned parking area. The plates had been removed. Local police searched the vehicle and discovered a discarded piece of paper in the ashtray that contained the following words. The boy and girl have been so nice to me. It's going to be a real shame when the time comes to get rid of them. The note ended with the sentence, I will be far away before the truck and those people are found. Well, okay. Why would you take the plates off your car but leave this in the... It's like, I just don't think this guy's very bright, I think is like one of my main conclusions from reading this thing so far. It's like, he tells all these lies, he's not really smart enough to, to be able to tell good lies, and he's trying to play this game with the police, but the police are smarter than him, or he's just like leaving these clues that he thinks are clever but are really stupid. After thoroughly violating the first rule of casual criminalists' rules for criminals, Randall Smith was apprehended on June the 22nd after he was discovered camping near his abandoned vehicle. Many of the rules don't apply if your end game is killing yourself, because then it doesn't really matter, does it? Like we said, you're dead. Nothing matters. After receiving the call, Deputy Lawson, although we're not sure that that is his end game here, are we? After receiving the call, Deputy Lawson gave his room number to the local police, and a few minutes later, a patrol car pulled up with the potential suspect handcuffed in the back seat. Lawson rushed outside. And the moment he laid eyes, laid eyes on the man, he knew 
that it was Randall Smith. Randall was ragged and had always been living outdoors for quite a while. His clothing was filthy and stained, and his skin was covered in marks from several hundred insect bites. Lawson asked the man's name, but he simply shook his head, saying that he couldn't remember because he bumped his head and was suffering from amnesia. Of course he was. It's like, did you do these crimes? Don't remember. I uh, suffered a traumatic brain injury and uh, can't remember. Maybe that makes me not guilty. I don't know. <laughs> the lawyer will be like, mate, that's not how it works. But until then, you can be like, <laughs> remember, he's not very bright. Now, I'm not a doctor, nor do I know much about head injuries. However, what I do know is how to Google things, and I would like to tell you a couple of facts about amnesia. First of all, despite what lazy TV and movie writers would have you believe, amnesia is actually very rare and pretty serious. It's not just something that happens because a person bumps their head and then it resolves itself by the end of the episode. No, this was always like... I'm always like with the bumps of the head, like especially having kids and stuff, they're like, did they lose consciousness? And then you've got to keep an eye on them for so long. And it's like, if you get knocked on the head um, and lose consciousness, that's way more... That's You know, you've got to go for your brain scans and shit because you could just die later that day what was that wasn't there um was it bob saget who like fell over in the bath in the hotel room this is what they speculate happened knocked his head and then just lay down on the bed because he knocked his head and then died and i'm like that's really sad bob saget's such a legend i was like oh no then i was, just, I was like oh <laughs> now i'm sad again because bob saget's dead oh and third, when amnesia does occur, it's often caused by strokes, seizures, heart attacks, brain tumors, or carbon monoxide poisoning. That is the only case where you're like, oh man, I hope it's carbon monoxide poisoning because all of those other things are worse. Even seizures, like stroke, heart attack, brain tumor, obviously terrible. Seizures, it's like, yeah, that's that's probably of those four things. If someone was like, do you want a stroke, a heart attack, brain tumor, or a seizure? I'd be like, I'll take seizure. But it's still really bad news and you're probably not going to be able to drive anymore which is kind of a hassle. <laughs> when physical injury is the cause, it's usually the result of a very traumatic incident, such as a car accident or falling down multiple flights of stairs, not bumping your head on a tree limb, you terrible, terrible liar. Deputy Lawson rolled his eyes. This was definitely Randall Smith. <laughs> However, in order to take custody of the man and transport him across state lines and back to Virginia, he had to use a bit of trickery to prove it. He looked at Randall and then looked at his bug bites. He leaned in to examine them closer, shook his head, and then whispered something in the ear of the arresting officer. Officer. The officer looked surprised before shaking his head in agreement. Randall's interest was piqued. He asked the men what they were talking about. Lawson and the officer took a moment and then told Randall that the bug bites on his skin had become infected and without proper medical intervention, he might well die. <laughs> Remember, Randall's not very bright, so what happens next? <laughs> Randall considered this for a moment and then pleaded with the officers for help. Officer Lawson told him that in order to receive treatment, Randall needed to fill out a medical consent form using his full legal name. Randall agreed and the officer presented the form to him. Oh, Randall, you're not that bright, are you? One, those bites. You're an outdoors person. You don't know what, it, what an infected bite looks like? Come on. Secondly, what, you really think? You really think that the police officer is going to deny you medical treatment when you're dying because you're not providing a name? <laughs> Come on. Sure they are. At the bottom of the page, the man with amnesia hastily scrawled the name Randall L. Smith. Establishing motive. Now, Randall Smith may not have been a big brain, but Deputy Lawson was convinced that he was not mentally incapable of answering for his crimes either. No, of course not. He's just not very clever. He's just a bit dumb. Is he capable of committing crimes? Like, does he have... Was it a corpus mentis? Compsus mentis? Something like that, right? When you're, you're like capable of doing this shit? Obviously, he's just stupid. Like, stupid people could commit crimes. He didn't believe for a second that Randall was unable to understand right from wrong, as the signs of premeditation and subsequent cover up were all there. In Lawson's mind, the events that transpired the night of Susan and Robert's murder probably went something like this Randall Smith left his home sometime between May the 15th and May the 19th. He made camp at an unknown location somewhere in the woods around Dismal Creek and likely began walking the trail as soon as he arrived. At some point, Randall met Susan and Robert, and the three began hiking together. After traveling with them long enough to be seen by several other hikers, possibly a day or more, Randall parted ways with them and either returned to his own camp or, more likely, followed closely behind him, just out of sight. Yeah, this is like, I don't know, I've done a lot of hiking in my days. And this is one of the things, like, when you're on a hiking route or whatever, and there's people, everyone's walking in the same direction, and like someone strikes up conversation with you, and you're just, you're just wanting to hike. But the problem is, everyone, you're hiking in the same direction as them. And it's like, what am I supposed to do? Just start walking slower, because they'll walk slower. You start walking faster. It's just, I just want to be with my own thoughts in nature. Do we have to have a conversation right now? 
So come on. Based on the contents of their stomach and the level of digestion that was seen during the autopsy, we know that the pair ate a relatively large meal and that they were killed fairly early in the night. Because of this, investigators believe that Susan and Robert ate their dinner and immediately went to bed. As soon as Randall saw they were asleep, he approached Wapiti Shelter with a 22 pistol that had yet to be recovered. After stealthily approaching the campsite, Randall attempted to quickly eliminate Robert by firing a single shot directly into the back of his head as he slept. However, because of the small size of the 22 caliber bullet, the shot failed to penetrate Robert's skull. Instead of dying instantly as Randall had intended, Robert struggled to his feet and attempted to wrestle Randall to the ground. During the scuffle, Randall shot him in the face. This time, it was lethal. Robert collapsed onto the floor of the shelter. His blood flowed over the floorboards, staining them, and then pooled underneath. Randall then turned his attention to Susan. By this time, she was more than likely on her feet. Instead of shooting her, Randall used a nearby fire poker to knock her senseless, and then, using a spiked nail that he pulled from the Wapiti shelter itself, stabbed Susan 13 times. As he did this, Susan fought back and received lacerations on her hands and wrists. Because of the different ways in which the two were killed, police believed that Susan was Randall's primary target, as she had been the focus of his rage. Robert's death was less personal and seemed to have been done in a way that would have quickly incapacitated him had the bullet penetrated his skull. At this point, Randall may or may not have sexually assaulted Susan. The autopsy results were inconclusive because the body was in poor condition by the time it was discovered. After ensuring that Robert was dead by firing a second shot into his face, Randall moved and buried both of their bodies in separate shallow graves. He then returned to the shelter, gathered their things, and took his time as he distributed them throughout the forest. It was during this time that Randall is believed to have left the bloody fingerprints inside Susan's book. This is a very weird way of, like, dealing with a crime scene. Why are you sprinkling their belongings around? Did you just want to touch everything as much as possible with your bare hands? You fucking idiot. Did you want to leave as much DNA and fingerprints at the scene as possible? Also, why is shallow grave even a thing? If you're digging a grave, there is no situation where it should be shallow. It should always be deep. It doesn't matter if you're burying someone as part of a funeral or because you murder people and you're hiding in the forest. Don't use shallow graves. Use proper graves. Go deep, like six feet or whatever. Isn't that that TV show, Six Feet Under? Do they really bury people six feet under? That's really quite deep. I'm like about six foot tall, just shy. Like... That's a good distance. He then returned to his mother's home, threw his bloody clothing into the wash, and wrote the fake kidnapping note. What are you doing washing your bloody clothing? We've talked about this. Always burn the clothes. Burn it until there's nothing left. Within the next few days, Randall left home without saying goodbye to anyone. He then fled to South Carolina, where he abandoned his truck and camped in unfamiliar territory for about a month. After being captured, Randall was transported back to Virginia, where he was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. During police interrogations, Randall continued to feign bouts of amnesia. When they asked him general questions about his life, he would sometimes give vague answers, but when the questions became too direct or personal, he would casually slip away and claim not to remember where he was. A psychologist was brought in to examine him, and he concluded that Randall was unsurprised surprisingly faking his condition. Shocking. <laughs> the amnesia would continue intermittently for the next few weeks as the prosecution continued to build a case around him. The fact that Renzel had committed the murders was not up for debate. However, their biggest concern was that they could not establish a motive. This was apparently a problem as they felt they would not be able to get a conviction without one. Do you not have enough evidence? He was sprinkling all that shit around with a bloody fingerprint. Come on. Now, taking all of the evidence that I presented you into account throughout this episode, I'm not sure why the prosecution felt this way. They had the bodies, they had the murder weapon, they had witnesses that could place the three of them together. They also had a note admitting that he planned to kill them. They had Randall Smith's fingerprint stamped in the victim's blood at the crime scene. It's his fingerprint in the victim's blood, in a victim's belonging, at the crime scene. Are you shitting me, prosecution? This is a lock. Go, go, go. I don't think I've ever seen a more ironclad case, but as I said, establishing motive was a big concern for some reason. So, for the next few minutes, I'm going to present to you the various theories that were considered and give you the evidence that both supports and refutes each one. By this time, most people did not subscribe to the idea that Randall had planned the entire ordeal as an elaborate murder-suicide. The first and most obvious problem with this theory was that Randall Smith was still alive. They reasoned that if he was willing to go through with the murders, then he would probably be willing to go through with the suicide as well. In addition to this, although the placement of Robert and Susan's things had originally seemed random, Deputy Lawson later said that he believed that the items had been hidden in a complex pattern aligned with compass points. He believed that Smith had done this because he wanted to be sure that he could locate them later on. Obviously, there would be no point hiding souvenirs if he planned to kill himself before the bodies were even found. And lastly, there was the discarded note that was discovered in the truck's ashtray. The last line of it read, I will be far away before the truck and those people 
are found. If Randall had planned to commit suicide, the note would have probably said something like, I'll be dead before the truck and those people are found. So, with the suicide theory off the table, other theories were presented, but none of them were very convincing. Because so many of his lies revolved around women and relationships, many theories centered around the idea that Randall committed the crime because he was attracted to Ramsey. The prosecutor's theory was that while Randall traveled with Susan and Robert, he became infatuated with Susan and either made a pass at her or attempted to sexually assault her, at which time Robert intervened and ordered Randall to get lost. Unable to deal with the rejection, Randall followed them and killed them in retaliation. The brutal manner in which Susan was killed gave credibility to this theory. However, it is also refuted by the note, This boy and girl have been so nice to me, it's going to be a real shame when the time comes to get rid of them. This obviously alludes to the fact that although no slight against Randall's pride had occurred as of yet, he was planning on killing them anyway. Another theory that was put forth by Smith's neighbors was that because of Smith's deep connection with the Appalachian Trail, he imagined himself as a type of guardian of the forest. They believed that he would spend his free time watching and meeting hikers in order to identify what he saw as threats to the forest. Perhaps Smith had seen the pair doing something on the trail that he saw as unforgivable. This is complete speculation, so feel free to throw in as many alleged leads as you like, but some internet theorists believe that Smith may have stumbled across Ramsey and Malford having sexual intercourse, and he had either been driven wild wild with jealousy or had viewed it as deeply disrespectful <laughs> deeply disrespectful people doing something natural in nature oh no there is a bit more that gives credit to this theory but we will touch on that a little later in the episode the final theory is one that would be late to put forth in the novel murder on the appalachian trail by jess carr the book is a fictional recounting of the murder investigation and trial but carr did conduct many interviews with family members neighbors and other people involved with the case so while the book is certainly a dramatization she would have had plenty of insight while writing it carr's full theory is that because susan and robert were social workers they may have been able to recognize signs that smith was a troubled man. Carr believes that the pair may have tried to connect with Smith in a way that made him feel uncomfortable, and that because of how hard Smith worked up to build a wall of lies around his true self, their ability to see who he really was terrified him. It terrified him so much that he lashed out at them in fear. I mean, that's not going to be the first time in his life that he's come across someone like a psychologist or a psychiatrist or just someone who deals with troubled people, like social workers, whatever, who can like see through your bizarre nature because they've seen it before this isn't going to be the first time this I'm, I'm not so sure i buy this one looking at the note one last time it reminds us this boy and girl have been so nice to me it's going to be a real shame when the time comes to get rid of them the way that this is written implies that smith did not want to kill susan and rob but instead felt that he had to it wasn't a choice it was something that needed to be done. Randall may not have been able to understand why he planned to kill them and had written the note as a way to process emotions that he could not verbalize. In my mind, this is the most likely scenario, but I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. Um, yeah, I buy that. That it's like, I don't, I just don't think he's that bright. Like, I think he just got upset at these people for some bizarre reason. I don't know whether it's like the nature of the fo he, them having sex in the forest or because of them being able to see through his like weirdness or whatever but he became upset at them and he decided to come back and kill them because he's a because he's a murderer regardless of the reason all of the confusion and uncertainty revolving around the case caused a massive headache for the prosecutors and when it came time to take the case to court something unexpected happened despite all of the evidence that had been discovered prosecutors were still worried that they may not be able to secure a conviction they were worried that if the case went to trial randall may walk free and justice would never be served unwilling to take that risk they offered randall a plea deal 30 years Randall and his attorney enthusiastically accepted. On March the 23rd, 1982, Randall Smith pled guilty to two counts of second-degree murder. Damn, 30 years is a long stretch to accept on plea. Now, if you're thinking that this plea deal is a little light for a double homicide, again, yeah, well, yeah, 30, 15 years for each one. This is America, guys. Come on, let's go. You're absolutely correct. Residents of Perisburg were upset. Robert's father had been told that the state would be seeking a 71 and a half year conviction, practically a life sentence. So when you hear the number 30, he was justifiably a little pissed off. Tom Lawson struggled to rationalize the offer as well, but there was nothing more he could do. He and the other investigators had delivered Randall Smith to them on a silver platter, but they were choosing to avoid a trial. Prosecution seems very unsure of themselves in this case. I don't know why. It seems very locked down. Because I'm insecure! You can't tell! Overall, the entire debacle was, for lack of a better term, 
a shit show. Hikers and woodsmen were especially angry with the agreement, and some of them protested the decision the day it became public. Signs were held that read, Did Bob and Sue plead for their lives? Did Randall Lee Smith give them a bargain? Shame on the murderer. Shame on the justice system. While interviewing protesters, or one of them said the following, If another incident happens with Randall Smith, perhaps the people who are responsible for the plea bargain should be put on trial. Well, no, obviously not. But, like, 30 years. What, he's like 20-something, did we say? 30? He's going to be in prison a very long time. It's a it's a very long time. <laughs> like, I do think... It's a long time, that's all I'm going to say. I don't think... I, th- I don't... I think that double murder should be you know life um probably without parole but i don't know it doesn't feel like outrageously outrageous the anger lasted well into the election season and the district attorney in charge of randall's case lost the re-election after the initial shock had worn off most were still disappointed but overall relieved to have randall behind bars at least with the agreements he was guaranteed to be in prison until his late 50s where he could hopefully re-enter society as a reformed man however there was one small problem. Under Virginia's law at the time, Randall Smith's guilty plea meant he would be eligible for parole after just five years in prison. Oh my god. <laughs> to the credit of the court, they did not approve of Randall's request for release on the fifth year, nor did they for the subsequent ten years that followed. However, on September 27, 1996, after serving 15 years of a 30-year sentence for the slaying of Susan Ramsey and Robert Mountford, Randall Smith exited the prison a free man. Fifteen years for double murder is not enough. That is outrageous freedom now i said that randall smith left prison as a free man however that's not completely true as a condition of his early release he was ordered to wear an electronic monitor for a period of 10 years that's a long ass time to be being tracked i mean it's better than being in prison obviously if someone's like do you want to be in prison or do you want to wear the ankle bracelet forever and it gets a little bit smelly be like ankle bracelet ankle bracelet ankle bracelet let me get out of here please <laughs> Oh, man, he's got shanked! During this decade-long incarceration of a different kind, his location would be closely monitored by local police, who would be watching for any signs of criminal activity. When his mother saw him, she realized that prison had not been kind to her son. His once husky build was now a thin reduction of its former self, a wire frame. When he walked, his limbs moved awkwardly, as if they were stiff like a mannequin's. The first few years of Randall's parole, are a relative mystery. Most residents of Perisburg, including those who live nearest him, rarely saw him. His mother did all the shopping and ran all of the household errands while Randall stayed inside. He became even more of a recluse than before. What? Prison didn't fix him? <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm shocked and alarmed. One of his neighbors said, I would see him on the road and would wave. He wouldn't wave back. So I stopped waving. In 1999, Robin and Jason Stephan purchased the property behind the Smith's home, and Randall quickly approached the couple with a proposition. He told them that previous owners had allowed him to use the property to search for arrowheads and to access the Appalachian Trail. He asked that, as the new owners, they allowed him to continue this pastime. He then told them that he had been a Green Beret in Vietnam and had recently acquired a degree in advanced engineering. Of course he had. The couple responded by telling Smith to stay the hell off their property and away from their family. Yes. <laughs> It's like, that guy's weird. Get away from me. Who, where have I moved into? In 2000, Smith's mother died, leaving him completely alone in the house. After her death, Randall inherited the home and was seen more frequently, although he still rarely left the property. Many neighbors began to feel sympathy for him, as they often saw him roaming around outside his home and speaking to trees, sticks, and inanimate objects. After speaking, he would pause and then listen to see if they were speaking back. Eventually, he adopted a dog named Bo, and the two of them became inseparable. What are you doing, mate? <laughs> Why are you talking to trees? <laughs> I know you're dim, but they're not going to talk back. In the following years, Smith became slightly more social and attempted to gain the trust of his new neighbors, Robin and James, by acting as the world's most untrustworthy security system. He spent his afternoons watching their property line and calling them whenever he saw anyone cross into their land without permission. Once Smith confronted a group of teenagers attempting to enter the Steppens' property, he approached the teens and ordered them to leave, but when they refused, he flew into a rage and threatened them. Why don't you go down to the sheriff's office and ask them who I am and what I did? Yeah, I. Oh, and he's like he doesn't have to lie about it he went to prison he served like what 10 years was it 10 years 15 years for murder like he doesn't have to lie he murdered people you'd be like oh shit <laughs> jason would occasionally check in with randall to ensure that he was still alive and had not gone on another murderous spree but that all stopped when randall revealed to him that he liked to watch his wife 
He said that he could see her from a mile away with that jet black hair. Jason once again ordered Randall to stay the hell away from his family, and his infrequent visits to the Randall home ceased entirely. Oh my god, I'll be like, oh, dude, I just bought this house, and now I have to leave because you're a psycho. This is the prop, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm renovating a house now. My wife and I, my family, bought like a house. And uh, it's it's like a dump, so it needs like so much renovation. <laughs> Can you imagine? And it's so much work. It is so much. I, I say it's like I'm doing it myself, but it's like you know you're choosing shit and you got to organize all this stuff. And can you imagine you just move in? It turns out the neighbors are psycho, and you're like, oh for fuck's sake! I just spent like a year fixing this place, and now I have to leave. Yeah, that would suck. I didn't check that crime registry. I don't think there's a crime. Like I know in America, you can like look up where your predators are. I don't think you can do that here. I should have looked <laughs> should have looked that shit up. Although I know because I live in a city that if it did exist, there'd be loads of them everywhere because it's, you know, densely populated. And I'd be like, I'd just be scared. I'd be like, oh, fuck. What have I done? Why did I look at this? It hasn't changed anything. It's just made me afraid. Not for myself, obviously. On September 26th, 2006, Randall's parole ended and he was finally free to come and go as he pleased without the watchful eye of the government. He should... I feel like he should just have that forever. Like, if you've double murdered someone and you're out on prison and you were supposed to go to prison for 30 years, at the very least, it should be for the whole sentence of 30 years. And I just say, let's just put a chip under your skin and leave it there. Just like slide a little air tag under there. And just you just have to have that forever or like put it inside a bone so you can't cut it out that kind of shit don't murder people people are like, don't pose on his freedom he murdered two people he shouldn't have any freedom or he should have limited freedom forever he's also a weirdo unable to take a hint, he approached the steppens one last time this time he requested to buy a parcel of their land so that he could place a trailer on it he told them that he wanted it to be as near the appalachian trail as possible knowing that randall did not have the money to afford it the stevens declined and once again told him to stay off their property a year later the couple sold the entire parcel and to someone else to be done with randall and his creepy ways but not one to simply take no for an answer smith approached robin stevens one day in town and told her that he intended to sell his home and move far far away he said that he had recently been in the hospital and that his days of walking the appalachian trail were over and that he had things he needed to do in another state knowing that she was a real estate agent he requested that she come over to his home to take some photographs and act as his agent while selling it she declined very smart lady robin don't yeah don't go in the weird guy's house he's like oh but i could make some money off this don't make some money somewhere else don't go in the psycho's house in late March of 2008, with no inheritance left and his meager savings depleted, Randall's electric and water services were disconnected for non-payment. With no way to pay his bills, Randall prepared supplies, took his dog, and fled into the woods one final time. Almost an action movie. So, now we return to 2008 where our story began. I realize that it has been a while, so allow me to quickly refresh your memory. Scott Johnson and his best friend Sean Farmer had just shared a campfire meal of rainbow trout and canned beans with their new friend Ricky Williams and his dog Ricky, whose real name, I'm sure you figured out, is Randall Lee Smith, and he'd just risen to his feet and shot Sean Farmer directly in the face with the 22 caliber pistol that had been hiding inside his coat pocket for the duration of their meal. Sean Farmer saw the flash from Randall's hand and immediately felt the tiny bullet tear into his cheek sound around him faded and was replaced by a deafening ring sean looked up at randall but saw that his focus was no longer on him as it turned to face scott oh he survived that's awesome i didn't expect someone who got shot in the face to survive seeing the gun now pointed directly at him scott sprang from his chair and attempted to flee toward the nearby tree line two more shots rang out and scott felt a sharp tugging pain ripped through the side of his neck followed by another in his back the bullets didn't stop him however and soon sean scrambled into the bushes and out the other side yeah 22 caliber bullets are fairly small and for shot from a, a very small handgun they're not going to be very powerful or accurate i'm surprised he made the shot randall turned his attention back to sean who had somehow managed to rise to his feet and he fired another shot directly into the man's chest sean stumbled backwards but the six foot four 325 pound man did not fall that guy is a he, that is a big man that is the sort of man who has such broad chest the bullet just lodges in there like teddy roosevelt style blood was filling his left eye as he struggled to remain upright for a brief moment he and randall stared at one another before randall pulled the trigger yet again this time the gun only returned a soft empty click oh you're fucked randall <laughs> gun might beat 325 uh, pound six foot tall man but when that gun is out you're gonna get a 
beaten, Randall. <laughs> You're gonna get a beating. Randall's countenance was like that of a statue, expressionless and unchanging as he waited for Sean to make the next move. Sean's eyes darted from Randall to the gun to the direction that had last seen Scott and then finally back to Randall. With no sign of his friend and the man's dog barking wildly at him, Sean darted for the direction of his jeep. He did not know if Randall was chasing him, and he dared not turn back to find out. As fast as he could, with one eye now swelling shut from the trauma, Sean climbed into the driver's seat and turned over the engine. He threw the car into reverse and slammed his foot against the gas pedal. Gravel and dust flew into the air as his wheels attempted to gain traction. I don't know why he didn't... Randall's a small, frail man who seems to be starving in the woods. Why wouldn't he just beat the shit out of him? <laughs> He's a giant man! From within the woods, Scott heard the sound of the jeep's engine spring to life and knew that he had only moments to act. With each beat of his heart, blood squirted from the wound in his neck. The bushes beside him were covered in glistening crimson, and he feared that he might bleed outright there. Quickly, he plugged the hole in his neck with his finger, and bolting in the direction of the road, he emerged from the woods and stepped directly into the jeep's headlights. He waved his arms wildly in the air as the vehicle skidded to a halt right beside him. Scott climbed into the passenger seat and screamed, Go, Sean, go! Now, what I'm about to describe to you quite possibly the most badass thing that I've ever heard, and is the reason I'm awarding today's absolute legend title to both Scott and Sean. This is gonna be awesome. And isn't this title, isn't this section titled almost an action movie? Sick. Let's go. Sean Farmer, having been shot in the face and chest and nearly blind in both eyes from the swelling, closed his eyes and operated the pedals as Scott, who was still plugging the bullet hole in his neck with his own finger, steered the jeep from the passenger's seat. The two worked together as Scott gave Sean orders like more gas, less gas, as they spread through the curvy mountainous terrain at nearly 50 miles per hour. Holy shit. I love it. After several close calls and near accidents, the two made it down the mountain to a house that appeared to be occupied. Stop here, Scott shouted. These people will help us. The jeep halted in the middle of the road and Scott jumped out and ran towards the house. He shouted, call 911. My friends and I have been shot. Melissa Miller answered the door and saw Scott scan standing with a finger in his neck, his shirt soaked from collar to cuff in blood. Behind him, Sean stumbled from the jeep and began shuffling toward the house. Melissa rushed to the phone, dialed 911 before grabbing blankets and returning to nurse their wounds. 45 minutes later, an air ambulance arrived and began treatment. This is fucking epic shit. I love it. Scott heard one of the medics say that he didn't have a pulse. The next thing he knew, he and Sean were in the helicopter, being whisked away to a nearby hospital where a team of doctors and nurses were preparing for their arrival. Scott smiled. Somehow, they had made it. Um, I, I, I did not expect it to end this way. This is, when you do these episodes, right, and I'm, when, when you listen to them, I'm sure as well, you're like, okay so they get shot and then they die and hopefully the guy goes to prison there's very rarely the 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 action hero style ending and it's fucking nice to get that today yes the last lie After failing to unjam his 22 pistol, Randall had allowed Scott and Sean to escape. He grabbed the keys to Scott's Ford Ranger and ordered Bo into its cab. He fled down the mountain, where he was eventually spotted by a trooper who gave chase. After a brief pursuit, Randall crashed Scott's pickup and was badly injured. He was pulled from the wreckage and taken to the same hospital where Scott and Sean were being treated. <laughs> Scott and Sean proceeded to beat his ass. No, that's that's I made that up. They're probably recovering from major surgery. While processing the crash site, the trooper found several items, including the truck itself, that linked Randall to the shooting. A pair of Scott sunglasses were found on the floor, along with the 22 caliber pistol, more than 20 knives, meat cleavers, and several other unspecified weapons. Also in the floorboards, they found several bizarre drawings and rambling notes. Now, I remember earlier in the episode when we were talking about motive, and I said that there may be more to the guardian of the trail theory. While this note played no small role in revitalizing that theory, it was a prayer that read as follows. Hail to the guardians of the Watchtower of the North, by the powers of Mother and Earth. Hear me, show me thy glory, I invoke thee, O ancient ones. This is apparently a Wicca prayer, and while I have no interest in researching Wiccans, this is apparently enough to give credit to that theory, so we do with that what you will. I just think he's lost his mind a little bit definitely not lost his mind enough to stand trial for these crimes and go to prison forever. Five days later, Randall Smith was released from the hospital. Former Deputy Tom Lawson, now Assistant Superintendent of Giles County Jail, once again ushered Randall Smith into a jail cell and closed the door behind him. Randall never gave a reason for the second attack, nor the first one for that matter, and just a day later he died alone in his cell. An autopsy revealed that he likely died from the injuries he sustained during the crash and that he may have been released from the hospital too early. 
to, uh, I mean, and to, to that, all we can really say is, oh no! <laughs> oh no, what? They released him too early and he died? Shit. What a shame. Not really. I'm glad he's dead. <laughs> Shit. Scott Johnson and Sean Farmer both survived that evening with Randall Smith, and after a long recovery, both are still alive and lead normal lives. I'd like to say normal action hero lives. Scott had to have extensive surgery on his neck and was in the hospital for six days. As for Sean, the doctors told him that the bullet missed his carotid artery by one millimeter. If Randall would have hit it, Sean would have bled out within minutes. To this day, so much of the mystery that revolves around Randall's life still remains. What exactly went wrong? Was this a case of nature or nurture? Why exactly did he feel the need to kill? He was intelligent enough to know what he was doing was wrong and attempt to cover up his crimes, but he did so in such a poor way the one has to wonder why he even tried. Well, I think the word is, he's just not very intelligent. I'm surprised you used that word, Matt. It's just, I don't think he's, I just think he's dumb. I just think he's not like, you know, really, really dumb. He's just, he's just like, maybe, I don't know, like IQ of like mid 80s, <laughs> 90s, something like that. Just a little bit dim. The only thing we know for sure is that Randall didn't want to be himself. He wanted other people to think he was more than he actually was. He wanted someone to notice him and perhaps he just wanted a friend. Perhaps if Randall had found that friend, things may have turned out differently for him. Perhaps if he had chosen to be himself, he still might be alive. If there is one lesson that I learned while writing today's episode is that as much as we might want to, we can't control what the world thinks about us. The best we can do is be who we really are and hope the world accepts us. This is a lesson that Randall Smith never learned, and as a result, he died just as he lived, alone. Alone in a cell, alone with no one but his victims and their families to remember his name. To remember not with joy and celebration, but as a liar and a murderer, the way that no one should ever want to be remembered. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. While on probation after his release in 1996, Randall was approached by a man seeking a favor. The man showed Randall the book that had been written about his crimes, Murder on the Appalachian Trail, and requested that he sign a copy. His reasoning was that he believed a signed copy would be worth something after Randall died. Randall refused. Number two, Wapiti Shelter is actually still standing to this day, and many hikers continue to use it despite its tragic history. Many who stay there claim that they can hear the screams of Susan and Robert coming from the forest at night, and the top search result on Google for Wapiti Shelter is a video titled, Wapiti Shelter, Is It Haunted? I'll leave that for Simon to decide. The answer is no, and you're not hearing screams, and stop being douchey about these people. They were murdered. Have a little respect. Number 3. Randall's dog Bo survived the crash and lived a full and happy life after being adopted by one of Randall's former neighbors. I could have put this fact in the actual script, however, I just wanted to leave everyone with something happy to end on. So you're welcome. That's nice. This has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoy this channel, like, subscribe. Um, or if you're, if you're listening to it as a podcast, it also goes out as audio. Leave us a review. That would be grand. And I'll see you next time.